Let's start off from the Ashanti region where the Paramount Chief of Kokofu says fear of political tagging is creating a culture of silence among some Ghanaians, including chiefs. Berima Kwesi Okojiesu II observes the situation is taking a toll on free expression as it affects the national discourse on critical issues. He spoke at a public forum in Kumase on early warning system for potential election violence. Representatives of media and civil society organizations are other groups to partner the Regional Security Council to ensure regional peace. Reverend Professor Asante discounted the widely held assertion justice is a condition for peace. He points out it is rather a peaceful environment that people can seek justice using democratic structures. According to Reverend Professor Asante, in Ghana's quest to maintain peace, it's important conflicts are well managed to prevent escalation. The, the bigger institutions, when they attend international conferences, they are talking about Ghana as a showcase. And a lot of them are saying it's not a showcase. So they are waiting for us to be in the same soup as all the others. And we should resist it. We should maintain our reputation as peaceful people. In saying this, I do not believe that we have to overlook the issue of justice. What is justice? What is justice? When people talk about justice, and I'm about the audacity to ask people who keep on talking about justice, what is it? Is justice chopping people's hands? What is justice? It is the condition for the possibility of harmonious living. That is what you call justice. And I keep on saying that you can only talk about justice in the context of peace. Without peace, no justice. I don't think that when bullets are flying, people have gone crazy, houses have been burnt, you can stand there and shout, justice. It is only in times of peace that people are able to sit and then talk about things that we need to do justice. To prevent people from doing unlawful business, of annihilation. Regional Director of the Electoral Commission, Sirebu Kweku, reaffirmed the Commission's commitment to conducting free, fair and transparent polls. The election was free. Fairness, fair election. We are applying the rules and regulations governing the election without unfairness, without preferences, so that equality before all the processes. In the course of registering... Regional Minister Alexander Kong called for intensified effort by civil society organizations to eliminate the threat of violence. ...to ensure that we don't call and create troubles. Now, in doing conflict resolution or risk management, I think the most important is the elimination. If we can, and we can get all the results from the early warning signs, then we should work towards elimination of possible crowd about. Now, political scientists are divided on the state of political party campaigns 40 days to the elections, while some describe a suspicious attempt by political parties to derail gains made in Ghana's democratic process with the late release of their manifestos. Others believe the NPP's manifesto policies offer better alternative for economic prosperity if the party is able to achieve them. These were views from a roundtable conference on the 2016 elections in Accra. With 41 days to the general elections, political parties have intensified campaign activities across the country to woo Guinean voters with their policies. However, while they are at it, stakeholders are raising concerns over the conduct of these campaigns, with some describing the late release of the manifestos as an attempt to prevent any serious analysis of the content. Political science lecturer at the University of Ghana, Professor Ransford Jampo, believes the late release of the manifestos amounts to acts that relapse Ghana's democratic advancement. I see if we have 
campaign addressing these issues, then uh, manifestos addressing these issues, the manifestos should come on time so that we can all discuss. But um, beginning from the 2016 election, I see a surreptitious attempt to relapse Please. Ghana's democratic advancement and the quest to promote issues based on um, politics or elections. Why do I say so? This is the first time that we are having um, the two leading political parties presenting their manifestos less than three months to election. And so why, how do we digest, how do we read, how do we understand, and how do we um, digest what they have said to be able to hold them accountable you know, to them? And Professor Jampo also lamented the absence of serious platforms for presidential aspirants to debate ideas. There is now also no serious platform to debate some of these manifestos. Now, um, somebody is running away from uh, presidential debate. Another, at, at one point he said, I won't do it. At another point he said, I will do it. The other person is saying, I don't know whether I'll do it or I won't do it. And it is not during party rallies that you can critically discuss manifesto provisions. It is during important and credible platforms like presidential debate that people will be subjected to strict proof of whatever they say that you can have um, a, a healthy contest of ideas. Dr. Bosman Asari of the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana, on the other hand, thinks the MPP's policies heading into the elections are ambitious, but if they can be achieved, Ghana would get to the promised land of economic prosperity. A careful look at the political platforms of the two parties suggests that the MPP one is very, very ambitious. If they can do it, if they can do it, Ghana will get to the promised land of economic prosperity. I think one unique thing about the MPP platform is that it encourages the private sector, thereby limiting the state's role in the economy. Dr. Bosman Asari is also predicting Ghana is likely to have a divided government if the NPP wins the elections and the NDC wins majority of seats in parliament. I would say this is going to be an interesting election. Ghana will likely have a divided government for the first time if the NPP wins the presidency and the NDC wins majority of the seats in parliament. The reverse is also possible. The apparent absence of ticket splitting or what we call in Ghana, skirt and blast means that this scenario is unlikely. But 28 taught us that everything is possible in Ghana's election. The event was aimed at exploring key campaign issues of interest to Ghanaian voters, different political parties and their platforms, and the role of gender in the 2016 elections. Now, President John Mahama is later today expected to meet the Ochehine Amwati of Oripenin in his palace in Chebi in the eastern region. It's day three of his tour of that region today. And as he scales up his campaign for a second term in this year's polls, he's also expected to commission the Coco Road in that town. And yesterday he was in Fantiakwa and Etuwa to give the message of the NDC to the people there. Let's now speak to our correspondent, Kofi Sion. He's following the president. Kofi, we understand the Ochiman youth, uh, the members of the Ochiman youth are unhappy about some things there. Even as uh, the president prepares to meet the Ochehine, what are their issues? Well, Beatrice, you know, some time ago, uh, that was the early part of this year, there was this uh, kind of misunderstanding between the Ochiman police, the people there, and the NDC regional executive in the eastern region. Uh, they said that the NDC executive, particularly the regional chairman and the regional youth organizer, has been insubordinate. They have misconducted themselves against the, their overlord, Osadjefo Amwetia Oforipeni. So they wouldn't allow him, they wouldn't allow them to uh, enter the palace anytime there is a program there. And you know, actually, they, they said that those, the two people have insulted the Ochehine. I do not know the kind of words that they use, but that is their claim. So now, now that the president is coming there exactly today, the youth group in the area are saying that they are not going to allow the two people entry into the palace. So that is what uh, the Ochehine Youth Association has been saying. Apart from that, uh, they welcome the president and his entourage to the palace today.
Kofi, this issue you're talking about, is this something the police is taking seriously or, you know, it's it's not anything they want to pay attention to? Well, currently, I'm not taking any signal from the ground as to whether the police uh, are taking interest in this matter. But I'm sure that uh, the issue has gone viral on social media and on traditional media. So I'm, I believe that the police and the security agencies would take interest in that. But I'm getting information as well that the chairman and the youth organizer uh, may go or defy the threat issued by the youth and enter the palace. And Kofi, before you go, what else can you report about today's tour? Well, Bitri, you know today the president, apart from paying a visit to the Ochehne to have some pep talk to him, uh, he also inaugurated Coco uh, Road and in the Chebi Township. Uh, you know, some time ago this year, he was in Chebi about two years ago to cut short for the commencement of the Coco Road project in the area. And just two, down, two, day, two, day, two years down the line, the president is back there to commission the completed road project there. So uh, after that, he will head towards uh, a green salon also to check or to, you know, inspect some of the roads that uh, they, have contracted, they have constructed under the Coco Dictated Road Project. So uh, that is the uh, our scenario for the president today. Thank you very much, Eastern Regional Correspondent Kofisio. And of course, I was telling you about where the president was yesterday, and of course he was in Fantiakwa and Etiwa. Here are excerpts of what transpired yesterday. <laughs> Petrol has increased in Saudi Arabia. And it Nigeria, Nigeria, it, it, they are also having some problems. What are saying? I was saying they are heading. Uh, I was saying uh, we're taking some tough decisions. And so four years, I have had to take some tough decisions. Sometimes you have to take some tough decisions. I have had to take some tough decisions within the four years. But I took it in the interest of the nation. It is like girding the foundation of my building established and having someone else come to tell me he wants to build on my foundation. That is not possible. It is not right because we all did the groundwork together to get the foundation right. The international financial institutions have projected a period of prosperity for Ghana from 2017 onwards. This means we are done with the difficult work. It means we are now about to build the actual house. I have come to do what God knows is in my power to do. <laughs> stay on the campaign trail and the new patriotic party's presidential candidate Nana Adudankwa Akufuadu says the massive reception he's received from Ghanaians as he tours the regions is making the NDC shiver during a rally at Inkwanta as part of his tour of the voting region Nana Adu said he's confident of victory as the country heads to the polls in 40 days he said the massive crowd shows Ghanaians are ready for change The MPP took its campaign off the voter region to the Nkwanta North and South districts on the third day when Anato continued to record massive turnouts. In Nkwanta North, he paid a curtsy call on the chief of Pasa at his palace, where the chief, Ubo Tasan Kunja VI, 
reaffirmed the allegiance of his traditional area to the MPP and blessed them. Nana Kufado was mobbed on his way to the rally at the market square where hundreds stand out to listen to him. Alan Tremanting, who joined the campaign team on the third day, charged residents to vote out the Mahama-led government for failing to provide Ghanaians with jobs, assuring that the MPP will make sure there's abundance of jobs during its administration. Nana Kufado, whose message has been consistent, retreated the revival of the NHIS, free secondary school education policy, one district, one dam, one district, one factory, and the annual allocation of $1 million to every constituency. He thus appealed for the support of the people of Nkwanta, North and South, for him and the MPP in this year's election. He arrived at Nkwanta later in the evening where he addressed the chiefs and people of the town. He retreated the earlier message delivered to the people of Nkwanta North. So that was actually a wrap of what happened yesterday. But what is he up to today? I'm joined on the line now by our reporter Fred Kwame Asari. Fred, what more can you tell us about Nanado's tour today? Hello, Fred. Can you hear me? Yeah, hello. Great. So I was asking, we just had a wrap of what happened yesterday. Tell us what Nanado is, his tour, what is, is, is going to happen today? Uh, I so from uh, Nanadi, I headed down to the contact out to the place, where again, we recorded a massive turnout of residents coming out in the number uh, to listen to the message of change. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, the voter reason or uh, the stronghold of the NDP is stumbling. Why did you say that? He said, uh, this is Saturday, so uh, on Monday, we're going to start, uh, start a love guy. I thought that we start some do the appear for sure. And then catching this, catching this, and catching to me. He has seen that uh, people came out in their numbers to listen to him. So really, uh, voters are in for change uh, for that matter, the whole country. Uh, today, Manado will be heading uh, to the Akan constituency and somewhere in the middle of the, of the daughter region, where he's taking his message of change to uh, residents or electors. In those constituencies, you also be uh, meeting with chiefs and elders in the uh, two constituencies as well. Thank you very much, Fred Kwame Asari. He's following the NPP presidential candidate, Nana Akofuado, as he takes his tour to the Vorta region. Now, the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture has justified the distribution of tricycles, wire mesh, headpans, outboard motors, other and other fishing implements to coastal communities, claiming that the move is just part of government's efforts to demonstrate its commitment towards the fishery sector. Sherry Ayite, in an exclusive interview with Joy News, explained that the government's vision is to ensure that the fishing industry grows to a point where the huge fish imports into the country will stop. She rejects claims that the move is aimed at buying the votes of the residents in the fishing communities. This administration under the leadership of uh, President Mahama realized that, no, we cannot allow the fishermen to do these things on their own. Government must also support them. As we are supporting cocoa farmers, we are supporting farmers, and we are supporting other sectors of the, you know, uh, food chain uh, development for food security. Okay, so this is just support. but. The coincidence of time makes people assume that it would give the electorate some bit more of an appetite and, and, and a lot more reason to say, okay, now I have a tricycle. Why don't I just cast my vote in that direction? The timing is a bit more delicate at this, at, at this moment, precipitating um, a vote for John Mahama. I don't think it is true because um, uh, sometime in February, I was in Parliament 
I mean, you always have to provide, uh, to pro, uh, you know, put your budget before Parliament. You want to tell Parliament what you want to do for the year 2016, and then also in 2015. And in my parliamentary submission for my budget, you know, programs was, you know, the supply of uh, Albert Mutus and other social programs for fishermen. And this was approved by Parliament. In fact, Parliament asked me, how am I going to achieve these targets? And I told them how I would do that. And they approved it. And in fact, there are some MPP parliamentarians in Parliament who are very happy because they realized that for the first time, we are focusing on the social activities of fishermen in their constituencies. Good. So what are these expected outcomes for this project? Um, the outboard motors, the, the tricycles, the barbed wires that they have received. What need specifically are they expected to meet by within the fisheries sector with numbers? That's what I'm looking for. You know, we want to change lives. We continue changing their lives. We want to create jobs. We want to create wealth. Importantly, is wealth for the fisheries sector. So these outboard motors will definitely, the outboard motors that we are distributing, they have been designed in such a way that they are high powered and they can go very you know, far within our economic zone. And then they can also withstand storms on the ocean. So definitely, you can stay much longer on the ocean. And then in addition to the outboard motors, we are also giving them fish finders, where you can, you can locate where the cluster of fish are. And then uh, you don't have to burn your fuel. You go there, you just put it in the sea. You know that this place, I don't have to fish. I have to go to another side, you know. So it is purely to improve their livelihood, to improve their standard of living. We want to change the whole coastal life. We want to give them a better life, education, health. We don't want them to live the way they are living. You know, because uh, with us, increase you know, growth, increase uh, income, and it can change their lifestyle. But we, we still have a big deficit when it comes to um, our fish consumption and what we have. How does this contribute to bridging the gap between our needs and what we produce? Because Ghanaians eat a lot of fish. So that is why we are emphasizing on uh, fish farming, aquaculture. So it is Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development. And uh, we have about three training centers uh, where we train people who are interested in fish farming, tilapia, catfish. And uh, we have a lot, we, are have, we have a program with FU. We are training young people to go into aquaculture. And I can tell you that uh, when we took over, we were producing about 5,000 metric tons of fish through fish farming. And now we have reached almost 50,000 metric tons of fish. 50,000? Yeah, in fish farming. Aquaculture, uh, you know, uh, catfish, and then uh, uh, shrimps and uh, clams. So we, we, we are estimating that by the year 20,000, We'll be producing about 100,000 metric tons of fish. And you're still watching News Desk on Journeys on Multi TV, your election headquarters.